afternoon, everyone. My name is Manuelita Cody. I am the president of the North American Chilean Chamber of Commerce. On behalf of the members and the directors of the chamber, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And uh, I want to thank our speakers in particular and our moderator for being here and uh, supporting the activities of the chamber on this very important subject. Um, new technologies and cybersecurity. Um, I will have the pleasure of introducing our moderator today, Paulina Silva. Right, Paulina is a member lawyer from Universidad de Chile. She has an LLM in commercial law from University. Paulina is counsel at CARI. She has 16 plus years of experience She's led teams in privacy and tech contract matters and has worked at Uribe, Hubner and Canales and at Estudio Carvalho. I have the pleasure to give the floor to Paulina and she'll take it from here. Thank you, Paulina. And you have the floor now. Thanks so much, Manolita. It's, it's great to be here today. Uh, and thanks to the North America Chilean Chamber of Commerce to for inviting us to discuss this matter. So we read every day about security breaches all over the world, right? Threatening all kinds of industries and areas of society like financial insurance, the health sector, education, uh, attacking private and public entities. The consequences of the breaches are usually hard to assess and to foresee. And this growing threat has forced companies to reshape their business strategy to include a technical element that they weren't looking at probably 10 years ago. So how can companies begin to manage this sudden and urgent challenge of cybersecurity? To talk about that, um, we will be um, talking with Marco Zuniga and John Perea today. And first, I will present Marco Zuniga. He is a computer science engineer from University of Chile. Marco is the executive director of Chile Tech the Chilean National Chamber of IT Companies. He's also a board member of the Chile Chilean Cybersecurity Alliance and a strategic consultant with more than 25 years of industry experience as entrepreneur and senior executive, leader of innovation and transformation projects. Marco has been the program coordinator of Ch Digital Chile Atiende, National Technology Officer in Microsoft, CMO in Biokey, e-business director in Telefonica and product manager in Edibank, as well as a senior consultant to multiple, to multiple pri public and private initiatives. Marco, the microphone is yours. Thanks for being here. Okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, good morning in the States, good afternoon for, for Chilean people. Uh, thanks, Manuelita, thanks, Claudia, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure and honor to, to be here. So. Thank you, Paulina. With Paulina, we share a lot of different uh, spaces, e even in the uh, Alliance of Cybersecurity from Chile. So, uh, I don't know if you are looking at my I'm at my screen. Okay, are we okay? Paulina, yep. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for the invitation. It's really an honor to be uh, invited by the North American Chilean Chamber of Commerce. And on next 19 minutes, uh, I would like to share with you some thoughts about cybersecurity, but from a business perspective. Huh? Uh, as Paulina said, I've been involved, with, I've been lucky to be involved with a lot of different public and private projects. And basically, the idea of this presentation is to share with you some of the strategical points of view and, and what are the drivers that we have to define for these topics, especially from, from a business perspective. About our journey, uh, I will make a very short introduction. Thank you very much, Paulina, for, for your introduction. For those who are worried, we are not going to talk about technology in this presentation. We are just going to, to pick some cherries for, for, for the conversation. But basically, we're going to talk about business. We will talk about people, about what's going on with us in these days, especially in these difficult times. And we're going to analyze trust as the principal, the main asset of business. We're going to talk about that. Then, and only then, 
then we will softly land in cybersecurity. We, were, we will talk about cybersecurity, what are the main topics, but basically we are going to talk what's, what are the principles, the pillars of this conversation. About the presentation, who am I? Really, Paulina great, did a great presentation. Thank you very much. I'm executive director of the, of the main uh, chamber of IT companies in Chile. I'm also a member of the Cybersecurity Alliance. We, we share uh, chairs with Paulina in, in that environment. I also work as a strategic advisor. I, in the past, I've been part of Telecompra. Uh, I worked for seven years in Microsoft. I am also uh, director of the cybersecurity training program of CORE for the, the National Economical Agency for Development in our country, Chile. Uh, I'm a strategic advisor in PIMES and Linea is uh, basically for small medium businesses project from the government. We are moving them basically based on the coronavirus crisis, we're moving them to, to electronic commerce and also a mountain biker and mediocre chess player, but that's part of my life. Okay, let's get on the subject. And, and this presentation, it's a mix between theory, experience, a lot of conversations, experience, small projects, large projects, ramblings, whatever. So the first thing is that there's good things. There's good news that we have right now. Digital transformation, whatever that is, is here to stay permanently. Uh, if you pick 10 people and you ask them, you will receive 15 different answers about what's digital transformation. That's the reality, but that doesn't matter. The important thing is that this activity that we are having right now in this moment could be impossible. Uh, it was unforeseen one year ago. So reality is that we have now structural changes in the world. Not just, there are not temporary changes, but structural. And maybe you have seen before this cartoon or you have received it through WhatsApp or whatever. And the main question, this is from Business Illustrator, who led the digital transformation in your company? Answer, well, the first one, the CEO, the second one, the CTO, and the third one, the, the COVID. And basically something that everybody agrees right now is that COVID has been the, the main catalyzer of all the digital transformation of our world. We, we can talk hours about this. We are basically in an environment of business people, all the people that is right now in, in, in this webinar. And we all know that in business, the main assets, asset is trust, not just in business, also for policy, for politics, for countries. Trust is the main asset that we have as humans. And I want to invite you for a common business operation that everybody does every morning, maybe in the States or in Chile. For example, when you go to your local bakery, or to your local coffee shop, not just Starbucks, there are a lot of around the world, but when you arrive to that shop and you ask for a coffee, you have a lot of, a lot of trust in that operation because something that you are going to buy, you are going to put inside your bodies or you are going to feed your kids, your children with that food. That's an enormous, an amazing act of trust that we do every day, every morning, but we don't take care of that because it's so natural. So trust for all the operations and especially in business is the main asset. I think that there's no bigger act of trust for a team than the acrobats. Do you agree that the fact that I am going to put my life in risk for somebody that will pick me up in the right time with the right technique, with the right procedure in the right place, my life depends on that. So that's a big act of trust, okay? And in business, trust has also multiple dimensions. 
And that's something that I've been developing last years about what are the fundamental questions about trust. I want to especially thank Paulina because she helped me to write this in correct English. So thank you very much, Paulina. Okay, thank you. Well, first question, trader and client, who they claim to be, are really what who they say they are? Is that what I'm going to sell, what I declare to be, really? Is what I buy, what I understand it to be? Will the conditions be the ones that were agreed? Will I be paid correctly? Will I be charged correctly? If there's an unforeseen event, will my counterpart respond? And that's the reason why I presented you the example of the coffee shop in every morning because we answer automatically these questions in every business operations that we do every day. It's the same people that sells me the coffee, it's a brand I recognize, it will not hurt me. The, the amount they will charge me is the right, right amount. The, the, in the other side, the seller say, okay, Marco will pay the coffee he's, he's, he's asking for, okay? If there's a problem, for example, if the coffee is not correct, they will change it to me, for example. Those are the common questions that we do every day because our daily operations are based in trust. It doesn't matter if we as people, as a small middle business, business or a big corporation, all our operations are based in trust. The problem that we have, and it comes basically from 2000, we have a term that we use usually in boards. I, I have the, 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 the lucky to, to participate in different boards, and it's typical the VUCA environment that we live on. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. All the strategical analysis that we did, for example, using Porter, is absolutely broken in a VUCA environment. We can't think in strategical approaches thinking on next five years. It was common in the 90s, for example. For now, if you make a strategical approach for next 12 months, it's a long time. Usually it's three months, if, if, if it is accurate, okay? And a picture I found over the internet that represents the book environment is this girl sitting in an airport. She doesn't know when, how she's going to get home, if the process will change, who is going to carry her, what is going to happen to her in the next 24 hours? So that's part of the VUCA environment that our countries, our citizens, our people, our customers, our collaborators are confronting day by day. And the problem of this is that the, in the digital environment, the VUCA environment is absolutely amplified, okay? So going back to our fundamental questions, okay, that we talk about, about business. How do we answer the main questions in the digital environment? How do we learn about this? Do we really respond? How do we deal with the fundamental questions? That's part of, of the context of trust and business, okay? And especially in the digital environment or the digital economy or whatever term you want to use, uh, what's going on with the trust in the digital environment? I really uh, recommend you to have to invest 20 minutes and watch this Bruce Schneier's TED talk, The Security Mirage. It's a conference of 2010. It's more than 10 years, but it's beautiful. It's perfect. And basically what Bruce Schneier, it's one of the big theorics about security in general around the world, it's to understand the concepts between the reality of security, the feeling of security and how we as humans develop models for this. Really for people who is working in the strate strategical design of organizations, countries, whatever, it's so interesting to, to, to watch this presentation of, of Schneier because it explains a lot of, especially what, what are our biases. We have a lot of biases that also usually contaminate our analysis. And so that's one recommendation to understand that the feeling 
of security is as important as reality, but also related with models. I really, I recommend you 20 minutes very well invested. Okay. So after all this, is, is, if we accept that in business, the main asset is trust, the conclusion is that in the digital business, in the digital economy, in the digital environment, cybersecurity is the warrantor of, of trust. Is the main warranty to preserve trust of the business environment. And for that approach, uh, sorry to be in Spanish, this is a study that we de developed with IDC, all you are familiar with IDC in the Cybersecurity Alliance. And this is the basic model of cybersecurity, sorry, of cybersecurity maturity model from IDC that is based in five pillars, usually, and, and also, oh, sorry, uh, do, do you are going to, to see in, in, in John's presentation about the, the three main pillars of cybersecurity, technologies, process, and people. But the beauty of IDC model, it extends uh, these three basic pillars to also vision and risk management. So cybersecurity is not just about machines, about software. It's not just to train my people about what to do with a scam or a phishing. It's not just related to process. It's a whole ecosystem with three, five, four main pillars, but it's a trade-off that you have to design case by case. In, cyber, in cybersecurity, there are no silver bullets. So you have to make a specific design for every business, for every environment. For example, with the, state, with the states, we have profound and deep difference of culture between our countries. So that's a part of the conversation that we will have about what are the differences, for example, for this approach between countries like Chile, for example, and the state. IDC has extended this model. I invite you to, 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 to read about this, to study about this, because Trust will be the driver of business for next five years. We start about the risk management, but we're going to move to compulsory approaches, the strategic approach. And finally, we are talking about trust for the business environment. It's not just about hardware, software. It's a new way to look at our world and to understand that the basic fundamental pillar of our society and obviously for our business is trust. I really recommend you to study about this. The next question is in my last five minutes, how do we implement? And the states you have given to the world a great gift the National Institute of Standard and Technology Risk Management Model to the entire business cycle. And this approach could be implemented for everybody in their daily life or for a small medium business or big corporation. And it's based in five verbs. It's really a beauty, this approach. And the five verbs are identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Paulina, I, I've seen beautiful presentations of Paulina here in Chile from his lawyer perspective, for example, the beauty of this model is that it's very simple to apply, but it's very complete also. Conceptually, it's so complete. So also my recommendation is to talk in your boards. Uh, I usually, uh, my customers hate me because usually I ask them the five verbs. Usually we think that protection is the solution and we give the, that responsibility to technical guys, to technical people. No, that's not enough. Not also the identification. A lot of companies say, I, I participated in board, they say, no, 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 we have a risk management procedure. We have identified all the risks that we have. It's not enough, okay? Uh, so this needs model is, I would say, supported, complemented by a lot of other standards, ISO 227 and all the, the family of standards, all the local regulations, whatever, but 
my recommendation is to start thinking about this, to make a strategic approach to answer to these five verbs. Um, last but not least, I'm 44, so, sorry, I'm 54, uh, 10, 10 years less now, I, I, I'm lying. Uh, I'm 54 years old, okay? And something that we have to take care of is that generations change. Uh, I've tried to make a, a short introduction about cybersecurity, about trust, but we also, I think that, especially for the business design, for policy design, for the responsibilities for our ecosystem, there's something that the older people after 40 years, we have, we don't take care usually about this. And I want to share with you a cartoon from an Argentinian guy. That was a serendipity for me. We, we don't have an Spanish word for serendipity, but you know what is. Uh, I'm sorry, it's in Spanish and I, I'm sorry for, for Cello, but I, I made a translation for this. This is this, the English version done by myself. I'm so sorry, okay? And this cartoon says, this lady, we've seen this. I, I have a grandson of, of two years and a half. I see my grandson here. Um, and this lady says something that we have seen a lot of times in, I don't know, McDonald's, Burger King, whatever. The typical inflatable and, and, and the furniture. This piece of furniture is to put the shoes on, be on before entering the inflatable. What are you doing there? And the answer of this little kid is, we are praying soon. It's very profound, the conclusions about this cartoon, because we still, all we are over 40 in this presentation. For us, it's natural to pick the diskette icon to save our document in Word, Google Drive, whatever, okay? For these new generations, it's unnatural. They don't know what's in the diskette. For older people, people over 40, the digital world is a representation of our physical experience. For the new generations, the physical world is a representation of their first experience that is digital. That approach makes a main difference about what a lot of industries, countries, policymakers have to take care about their designs, about their strategical design. So the difficult that we have to confront, but that's the beauty of problems to solve them, is to design user experiences, business models, cybersecurity solutions, principles, procedures that take care of both visions of the world. The vision from people that comes from the physical world to the digital environment, or people that was born in the digital environment and now is opening to the physical world. Well, in the last eight seconds, I made a commitment. Uh, thank you very, very much for, for your time, for, for your attention. I'm sorry for my bad English. Uh, but thank you, Paulina, for, for, oh, sorry, uh, that's my timer. Okay, come on, be quiet. Okay, thank you very much, we are okay, and now I give you back the mic, Paulina. Thank you very, very much. Great, thanks so much, Marco, for your presentation. And a very timely presentation as well, and, and, and really relatable and, and easy to understand. So now we will we'll be talking with John Perea. John is the practice lead for Talis in North America, where he leads the Security Operations Center and advisory and consulting services. John is an information security professional with over 15 years of experience providing IT, information security, and executive consulting, such as CISO advisories, vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, social engineering, digital forensics, and incident response. 
He worked with various business sector and has helped organizations identify and address their security and technology gaps. He has built secure infrastructure that supports the business needs and influences people to adopt information security culture. John also taught the cyber incident management course at the University of the School of Continuing Study. He is also a member of the Global Advisory Board for EC Council's Certified Incident Handler, ACIH, and Certified Threat Intelligent Analyst, CTIA. His presentation is on operationalizing cybersecurity from boardroom to operations. Thanks so much for being here, John. Oh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Paulina, again for that introduction. Uh, thank you again for the North American Chilean Chamber of Commerce for inviting me uh, to do this presentation with you guys. And thank you, Marco, for your uh, great uh, presentation as well. So my presentation actually, uh, I, I made this presentation to align on what Marco was uh, discussing. So uh, let me just pull up here my screen. And let me load it up. Okay, all right. So what just Marco was just describing is exactly what every business requires, right? Like from from that executive level, executive level of uh, understanding on how the trust is required and how it relates back to cybersecurity. So my my presentation is more toward to what's next, right? So from from that uh, overview of like the business understand. Uh, the importance of cybersecurity now, how you operationalize it. So I'm not gonna go too technical in terms of like uh, my the discussion, but I'm just gonna give like a bit of an overview or or a, a pre preview of what do we actually do when when we put this in in, in operation. So this is, this will give you guys a, a a better understanding on how that full cycle of cybersecurity works. So my agenda again, I, I just made this a small deck uh, to uh, as my discussion point. So we're gonna talk about like the cybersecurity threat landscape, uh, cybersecurity framework, and advancing your cybersecurity um, capabilities. And uh, after that, we're gonna have the Q and A uh, uh, for Marco and I and Paulina. So just going to the my next slide here. So as uh, Paulina already introduced, uh, thanks again, Paulina. So I'm uh, the practice lead for Thales for North America. Um, so I was fortunate enough that throughout my years, I was able to work on to different type of field within information security, now cybersecurity in the past. So from being an, an operation person who's working on protecting digital asset or the infrastructure of a company all the way down to actually trying to hack a company to make sure to see if what are the vulnerabilities in those environment and also going and doing some digital forensics if ever something happened to that organization or company that they got breached. So I, I came in and then I help out and investigate what happened. So through that cycle, so I learned from different angles of how how the the full cycle of cyber security works, and and putting a business mindset on top of that, and that's where my executive consulting comes in, right? So because I I, I need to explain to the technical folks on what's happening and 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 why is this important, and translating back that to the business, what does this technical jargon means and what's it mean to the business. So it, it's, again, I'm very fortunate like having those experience and I, I enjoyed that uh, uh, that experience that I had and explain to different, different uh, audience uh, per se, like from a business side and also from the technical side. So that's a, a bit of a background for myself. Um, so going to my next topic here, um, I, I would like to give you guys a bit of a preview, um, um, like what's 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 happening out there in, with regards to cybersecurity, like uh, this, what are the latest threats, what are the latest attacks, and what should we do about it? Right. So this morning, uh, so I I I I always do this every time I, I present. I I just like Google up what's happening in the news in cybersecurity. 
and and believe it or not like probably 10 years years ago or so when you start looking for this type of news you need to really dig and look for what's happening out there in the cybersecurity because it's either it's a it's a very big breach or like you are actually involved on that breach but since like uh for, for the past uh, five years or so you do a quick google search you will find like tons of uh breaches out there so which is shows that that there's a significant um, impact in terms of like what are the weaknesses out there so right now I, I just do a quick google search it says here like the nydfs uh, that's the new york department of financial services release a report about what happened to twitter uh, so twitter had some uh, some issues uh, recently uh, about their uh, their platform and then some of the vulnerabilities so the next uh, search that came out is actually another company uh got their database of their customer so roughly around 800 uh, customer record was uh leaked out so uh, people were able to download the, the the customer record and there's roughly around 15 million of uh that cost in a breach using a business email compromise that's the bec so i'm going to discuss that a little bit uh further on um, next thing that I, I also saw is uh, about the attempt ransomware attack in Tesla, right? So this was um, again they're still investigating this. That they 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 allegedly saying that the the attackers are actually willing to pay a uh, billion dollar to this employee to infect the factory. So it's it's uh, again those type of um, situation right now is happening out there because of that the, the technology and and people are actually trying to see uh, how can they uh, steal those type of uh, important information um, this one is like literally like a, an hour ago news like this morning uh, they were saying like a, a company in in europe again it's an it service provider received or is now um, experiencing a ransomware attack so this one too is very recent. NSA uh, just published um, a at the top vulnerability uh, technology out there that was used uh, to various attack in, 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 in previously or maybe even until now. So this technology or this vulnerability are more uh, advanced uh, attacks uh, that uh, they, they are releasing and they're just saying like if you have this technology you might want to look into it and, and investigate and patch those information so this year you minimize the impact or risk in your environment and, and the last one that I have here is uh, there's a survey that within the past two years there is like 2000% increase of uh, attacks against like uh, IoT or OT or operational technology devices or environment. So this environment is not your traditional uh, office environment in an enterprise. These are uh, the manufacturing company, the plants uh, that has like the robotics and machinery. So um, the they increase of the attack vector on those in organization because the attacker uh, is starting to find out that there's a there's a value for them to attack this environment because if they can shut down a company and extort the company for money to pay them and and that's that's the one of the driver for their uh their attacks right so i'm going to go over a little bit more on 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 that uh, type of attacks uh, shortly uh, so again, this is just us this morning. So as you can see, it's like there's a lot of topics uh, or news out there, uh, different, different, uh, different uh, industry, different uh, organization, uh, common team. Someone's got breach, right? And 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 with the current situation that we have right now in terms of remote work and stuff, those actually uh, amplify those type of attacks. Um, just to summarize uh, this uh, threat landscape uh, quickly, so I, I put out like the, the for 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 me the top uh, cyber risk at the moment that we have. 
so the remote user due to COVID impact. So as, as you guys know, like throughout the start of the year, we had this uh, uh, global pandemic that all organizations start working from home, right? Uh, so there's a bit of a struggle, people actually getting to work from home in terms of connectivity. However, there's more uh, impact in terms of the securing those access from these remote users. So I've I've done few investigation recently and in the past that uh, we had a situation that um, uh, users are actually struggling with their connectivity speed to work, and they thought that the 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 one that's causing that is their Wi-Fi router. So what they did is they unplugged the cable of their laptop and plug it directly to the modem. So if if you're not uh, aware in terms of those uh, the security risks that can cause, you you won't know that it's actually really bad, because what happened after that is it, it's like you're putting your laptop outside in the internet, out there and 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 just flagging yourself, hey attack me, because there's no wall or there's not nothing pre preventing them to actually attack you. And, and it's a common theme. A lot of people got breached about that. A lot of uh, data got stolen about that type of situation. And one of the, the, the reason is like not having that proper awareness that that could cause an impact in, their, in terms of your security. So the second one that I found that's very uh, common uh, for the past few years, and actually that costs a lot of money in terms of the business. So I, I investigated like probably uh, the, the cost of the breach just using the business email compromise is like around $20 million. So these are the email email account that actually got the your credential was stolen and and uh, the account was pretending to be you and messaging your uh, your financial controller or your CFO or someone who's handling the the, the financial side saying, hey, uh, I was talking to our executive. They need to get, uh, they need to buy this or procure this. You need to send this money on this account and 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 the rest is history. So this is a very uh, non-complicated attack. However, it's very effective um, since the that that trust between the the email address who owns that email address to the other person that who is receiving that address is it's there because if you're working in the same company, you're most likely gonna reply back, oh yes, uh, don't worry, I'll take care of it. So it's just a matter of uh, how you uh, position the the conversation to that other uh, the the receiver. Um, the next one that uh, again you guys probably heard this uh, too for the past few years is the ransomware, right? So the, the ransomware attack again they they they're still on the top of the list. Um, uh, they're getting more sophisticated. They're actually doing more damages than than before. That just trying to uh, get a couple of hundred of dollars to the to the user, but this time around they're actually. Uh, and making more money and then demanding more uh, requests or even uh, destroying the data itself, right? So th that's kind of, uh, in a way, you, we have as part of our, our job as a cybersecurity professional, so we, we always have to stay on top of this type of attacks and, and let people know about it. And, and so they will be more cautious next time. And, and for me, I'm, I'm taking this opportunity to speak to this type of conferences to let, let businesses know that this is happening and then you need to be aware of it. And, and one of the, the last part here is uh, the new connected devices and IoT devices. So these are your um, uh, new device, new gadget that you bought, like, like let's say for example, you want a new uh, camera for your pet, right? So you, you buy it from the store, you plug it in, you have it in, in set up, you're so happy that you can see your pet in your phone and stuff, right? And, and typically the, the vendors will always say uh, in their manual, change the password once you install it. However, mo mo most of the time, once people get so excited and they start st seeing the, the, uh, what it, it does, they kind of tend to forget about it and then leave it. 
and and, and the, that's the problem there that actually the, the bad guys are actually leveraging those type of devices to extort information or money from the actual owner because they can say oh i have your video we have some uh this uh, type of situation that we saw you in the video if you don't pay us we will release this video in the public so in, in a way we have to be careful and um uh, and cautious about what new devices that we put in in our environment or in your home uh, to make sure that uh, it's not just like uh, it's working but it's also secure uh, so just quickly um, on, on a on a, a recommendation quick recommend recommendation for this cy top cyber risk is being aware is number one uh, and also being diligent to become um, in what you do in terms of your using the technology or the computers or your earphones and IoT devices. Uh, second one, if you have an IoT devices account or your computer, so there's this uh, feature that you can turn on like the multi-factor authentication. So this actually help you uh, make sure that if your credentials or your password was stolen, they still need something uh, that you have either 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 a, a pin code or a SMS code before they can authenticate. So that's an, a, a good factor to, to mitigate those uh, com compromise. Uh, next one is protection, additional protection in your system and detection. And lastly, and this is more on the ransomware uh, situation is backing up your data because at the end of the day, if if you will only pay a ransom if you feel that you don't have access to those data. So if you have access to your data that was either compromised or, or got encrypted, uh, there's a chance that you, I mean, we always advise that don't pay because it's like you're empowering more of the, the this type of attacks. But if you have your data backed up, it, it's good to 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 recover from, from that uh, situation, okay? Um, so I'm just doing some time check here. I'm just going to do very quick. So uh, Mark already mentioned this a while ago about, say, what do we do now in terms of uh, um, apl applying this in your organization? So Marco provided a bit of a high level of the what's the NIST cybersecurity framework. So in cybersecurity, we follow different framework, different uh, uh, regular uh, the, the the guidelines that we do. Uh, this this is making sure that we we have a checklist to make sure that uh, based on the best practices out there, we have, uh, um, we, it's not about being compliant, but it's, it's more of um, having some, some good guidance that uh, if I follow this, it will help me minimize my risk. So again, there's, there's five pillars, there's identity, protect, attack, response, and recover. So I highlighted a few of them that, that, gives you a kickstart in terms of what you have to do uh, after, again, the, that boardroom discussion that you have from, from your executives, right? Uh, just quickly on the identity side, uh, we always say we can only protect what we know, right? So because if, if you don't know what you have in your environment, you cannot protect it. If I don't know I have a printer, I cannot protect myself from attack to the printers, right? So this is the, the purpose of that identify stage is trying to understand what you have in your environment, try to understand what are the risks in those uh, environments. Then once you identify that, it actually flows down to the protect mode. This is now trying to understand what do you need to protect these assets that you have. Uh, as, as Marco also mentioned, there's people, process, and technology. Right, so most of the the protection is more on the the technology uh, aspect. However, there's there are process and people that that component of those things to make sure that you have an effective protection. Um, the the second the next stage is the tech. So this is one, actually one of the uh, important uh, stage here is to to be able to uh, determine that there's something wrong you need to have a very good detection capabilities because as, as the your main goal is to make sure you capture something strong earlier uh, and risk and fix it uh, earlier versus your data is already gone or, or your your 
you're 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 already been breached. Your your customer information is already out there. Um, now, the next stage for the detect is obviously the how you respond to those uh, situations and how you recover. Uh, so this is in a nutshell in terms of in your in an organization on how they they look into the cybersecurity to operationalize it. Now, this is a good baseline, but how do you advance it, right? So the, maybe you have some components there that you already they have, but moving forward, how do you know if you're doing it right? So as part of this, this is actually recently released, uh, coming again from uh, the, the NIST and then the, 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 the US uh, uh, side, uh, the cybersecurity maturity certification model. So this is aligning back like uh, the CMMI type of uh, modeling uh, with uh, level one to five. But the, the purpose of this one, this component here in uh, the domain, 17th domain, there are there are some subcomponents inside it that you assess your organization on how well are you doing in, in terms of that situation. Are you level one or are you level three? And then from there for creating your strategy strategic uh, plan, you, you are now planning that for the next two years, here's what we need to do to make sure that uh, we improve it and move to level four. Uh, a very quick example, uh, the IR piece here, uh, the second uh, box from the, in the middle, uh, to, to assess the, the, the level, it's either, do you have a plan? Great. Do you know how to detect and report uh, if there's an incident? Okay, great. Do you uh, actually testing those plans? Not really. So that's where you show that either you're in the level one or uh, 2.5 or two, and then for your next year in your planning to operationalize it, you, you wanna put in, 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 in your plan saying, next year I wanna test my actual incident response plan to bump up my level of maturity. Uh, so the, the other thing that um, to be able to advance your cybersecurity posture is having that security by design mindset, right? So when you're, when you're implementing or deploying security, you, you wanna make sure that you understand that from the start, I'm already integrating the cybersecurity. Again, this is actually part of the digital transformation that Marco was also mentioning a while ago. Um, and, and part of that is also that defense in depth uh, uh, strategy to make sure that every little component within that faces, you have a security uh, in place to make sure that A, you assess and track your risk. And then lastly is you are prepared and you're resilient in terms of there's a like cyber attack that's happening in your environment. All right. So I think I'm a little bit overboard here, but um, that's pretty much the, oh, the, the other thing that I want to mention, Marco mentioned about the trust, right? So in terms of in the technology, there's a thing that uh, uh, we always try to encourage people is the zero trust in terms of your component or in your, in your, uh, in your environment. So what it means is instead of giving full access right away to everyone, uh, do it the other way. Try to, to think that I don't trust this user and, uh, and the gradually I will give him access to what he needs because in, in that way you control what they have and what they can see and what they can access. Uh, and uh, my last takeaway here, uh, again, this aligns back to what Marco was saying. Um, cybersecurity is, is no longer a technology problem. Right, so it's actually a business problem anymore. So we need to coordinate how the business and techno and the cybersecurity on from the technology side works together, and and that will give you a more uh, efficient uh, secure cybersecurity uh, capabilities. Okay, and yep, that's pretty much my my last slide here, uh, Paulina. Thanks so much, John. Um, I would like to begin the. the question slot of this webinar with a question to you, John, um, talking about the last part of your presentation and the need for a, 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 an efficient communication between the technical and the commercial aspects of the business. In, in your role as a teacher at the University of Toronto, you help students 
understand and balance the technical and business side of cybersecurity, right? So yeah. in that sense, how do you tell them? How do you tell your students to go about shaping the strategy of a security program to make it understandable to a non-technical audience, the board, the, the non-technical members of the C-suite? How do you yeah. teach them to tackle that, that challenge? Yeah, exactly. It's actually really uh, fun and challenging to to have that uh, situation. And then for me, I, I take that challenge as like, uh, this is my goal. I, I want to I wanna show uh, on both sides on how they, they kind of meet in the middle. So if I'm working with a, a technical person, that's already been good in terms of network security and all of those, uh, the 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 component of the technology for the cybersecurity. So I, the the approach that I'm taking with them is I'm involving them more of that. This is how the business thinks, right? So right now you're thinking this is a risk, but if the it, does it impacting the business? If there's no um, uh, let's say dollar value that's impacting, then you you need to translate that more in 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 a uh, uh, understandable term with the, the business side to say uh, yes right now the risk is high but if we add this more factor uh, it will lower down the risk that makes your uh, business uh, continuity workable so in a way I'm giving them like some like based on my experience based on the organization that I speak with so I'm giving that that those guidance to them now, vice versa from the, the business side of things. So this is when I, I try to explain to them that uh, because sometimes in business, right, they, they think that it's like if they snap their finger, it's like magic, like, boom, okay, I need you to protect me. So it, it's not just that quick, but you, so you need to give them a high level overview on what it is and what's the, uh, the components behind it, but not too detailed that they will get bored. Right, so you, you need to have those keywords or uh, key messages that you want to tell them. Okay, let's say, for example, um, the tech guy said we need a new firewall. Like, oh, I don't want to spend another blah, blah, blah for, for the firewall. Okay, so if you spend X and then do this, uh, this X will last you for another two, three years to protect our system for this type of attack that could cost you Y, it's a good investment. So that that's how they they understand this, like how it's impacting the business to make sure it's secure. Right to talk their language. Exactly. Perfect. Uh, Marco, do you want to add something to that? Do you have a take on that question? No, reality is that usually uh, over time, because myself, I'm a computer science engineer. I, I think basically that, that the approach is through years, you see that there are different ways to approach the cybersecurity from a business perspective. And I want, I, if you allow me, Paulina, related with the question from, from Miriam, she asked in the chat, if you don't have big IT teams on your organization to implement the NIST framework, do you still recommend following the framework with a reducer scope? Absolutely. Risk management and, and the approach, it's applicable to every level of the organization. Uh, my recommendation is to start identifying the risks, thinking about the possible risks, okay? Not, not, not to be paranoid about all the different risks that you may confront, but just to be consistent and gradually going to start a culture of uh, risk management from a whole per perspective, including IT technology procedures people. That, that, that I think that may complement that that answer. Okay. And and I, I would like to still uh, talk about a little bit more about the um, NIST framework. You know, I'm, I'm not from the technical business. I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I will ask this question just as a laywoman. Do we need to choose a standard? So you, you have both um, talked about the, the NIST cybersecurity framework model, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. But it seems to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, this is a question for both of you, that standards or, or, or frameworks 
are designed to make your job easier and sort of take you by the hand with each and every one of the, the, the stages that you need to go through in order to safe, right? Or to be protected. But again, from a labor woman's perspective, it seems sort of overwhelming having, or, or, or even, even understanding the role of standards. Uh, do we, is it advisable that you just stick to one or, or to several or, or choose a standard or how would you, how do you tackle that with companies? <laughs> Do you want to start, John, or? Uh, go ahead, Marco. You can just start. Um, in, in the techni technological and technical teams, we have a common joke. The beauty of standards is that you have many of which you can, you can pick one from. Uh, so the, the compliance concept uh, is not to adhere to a standard and to implement that. Now, as you say, standards help you, but from a business perspective, uh, John presented that in, in his presentation, the main worry that we have to have as business people is continuity of our business. That's about resilience. In the 90s, for example, we talked a lot about uh, full compliance and 100% uh, uptime and no failures. No. Today the approach is resilience. So with that approach, if you think that resilience and the business continuity operation of your business is the important thing, then you the recommendation is to be consistent. If in that journey you define to use some standards of some maturity model or to work with some technological providers, that's okay. The, it, there's no silver bullets in this, but the main uh, concern is business continuity and to be consistent and permanent and trying to going up in your maturity level. After that, what standard, which one, doesn't matter. Really the important thing is that your customers receive a service. Maybe after an, an event, events, could be cyber threats from, I don't know, criminals, terrorism. Uh, in Chile, we have a lot of earthquakes. Maybe we, on 2021, we will have a meteor. We don't know. <laughs> God, I don't know. We don't know which gift. I wouldn't be surprised. Will. Yeah. How, how God will surprise us on next year. So, but in area scenario, why do I think uh, I'm talking about meteors? Because we don't usually identify what are the risks that we are confronting. But from a business per perspective, business continuity is the goal. How are we going to attend our customers? How are we going to keep working with our collaborators? How are we going to collaborate in our business ecosystem? After that, if you have that approach from the board, from the shareholders of the company, and you promote this thinking all around your organization, you are going on. After that, the conversation is which standard, which model, whatever. Sorry but to then also, that answer. Also, besides business continuity, from a legal perspective, your other driver is just not to get sued, right? Not to get in trouble and end up in court having to pay a lot of money. And, and, and the legislations usually uh, grasp that challenge and they don't they don't force you not to be hacked you don't have an obligation not to be hacked or a prohibition to be hacked you have an obligation to be diligent and to enforce and and the, and, the, and actually at least gdpr and the the um, uh, draft legislation in chile for for data protection mentions technical and organizational measures but it doesn't say it, they, they don't say which measures and those measures need to be coherent with how critical your data is, right? So when, when you go and, you know, take the law as a, 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 um, not a standard, but, but, but a, as a set of instructions, it doesn't give you an answer. It just says you have an obligation to protect yourself and you need to be diligent in that protection with technical and, and, and um, organizational measures. So that's why I was asking 
about the standards because it seems that in, in identifying a correct standard or, or a correct, I don't know, procedure to look at the whole company, the whole, uh, the pain, the specific pains of the business, um, you'll be in a, in a better position to, yeah, yeah, exactly. to grab this challenge somewhere. Yeah. You know? just I just want to add on that one. So you, you, you're hundred percent right. The, the word diligent is the, the, the right terminology for this one. So again, standard is, is, a it's, it's a guideline. They'll let you know, like, Hey, if you follow this, you will have a good uh, way to uh, measure and protect yourself. H however, each organization is different. So it's the organization uh, uh, responsibility to, to make that good practice to become a best practice for their side, right? But you need to start somewhere and this standard will help you to start somewhere. That's very clear. Yeah, I don't and to complement, yeah. yeah. Please go ahead. Worldwide, I think this started maybe, I think 2017, 2018, for example, if you, analyze the World Economic Forum, for example, risk maps. You may see the last four, five, three or four, four years that cyber threats is part of the big risks that the world has to confront. But that's from the World Economic Forum. But now you can see a change of doctrine in every country. And for example, something that you are talking about is are part of the change of the regulations that we have in Chile. In the States, are, it's more regulated in some specific industries a long time ago. Is that you can't, uh, I don't know, if, if the sun decides to become a supernova, we can't do anything about that. The question is, who is responsible to identify the answers for unforeseen events? And now the bad news, especially for people in this conference, is that now the board members are responsible. And that's the change of doctrine that we have the last two years and especially this year. Because you can't assure nobody, no technical, real technical people will say we will not have a problem. We will not have an error even, human errors, accidents, or cyber criminals. The, the, the approach is, have you done enough in your possibilities to manage this risk? Have you been diligent? And that's the reason why last year, especially when, when different regulators are making to the boards responsible of cybersecurity effects, is now that it's changing. Those are bad news, okay? Because usually directors said, or sorry, board members said, okay, no, risk management is part of the manager of risk or from the technology people. Not now. Now, diligence of risk management is responsibility and they have legal requirements for the board members. And that changes the, the, the scenario. It's a big change of scenario. So it's now or next year, no more time. You have to do it right now. I don't know if it, it, it answered from your lawyer perspective, the, the difference. Yes, yes. And, and is that something that you're actually seeing in companies besides, you know, just wishful thinking? It depends. Uh, figures in Chile the, about the study that we released on June of, two, of this year, three months ago, uh, shows that about, uh, I'm sorry, I'm talking by memory, but uh, about over 50% of the big companies, uh, big companies in Chile, uh, we are a smaller economy than the States, but let's talk big companies over $100 million per, per year of revenue. Uh, over about 55, 56% are taking care of this at board level. Uh, and about 25% of big companies are really implementing cybersecurity. We are not in a desert, okay? There are some people that is conscious about this and they're making investments, but are not uh, all the companies. And the focus is especially for those companies that are regulated. For example, 
the finance industry companies, some of the manufacturing companies. We are also discussing about critical infrastructure. That's something that is going on in our discussion in Chile. The problem is, is with the small medium business uh, that over 75% are not even aware of this aspect. Mm -hmm. So that's the main difference. And that's something that maybe we have and, and we need that. We, we have talked about this, Pauline, a lot of times in our boards that we need really, it's not enough a public policy. When you work in public policy, you usually make a, a mix of carrots, sticks, and speeches. Okay, that, that's, it's, it's a long for, for people have been public. So the speeches are the carrots are not enough. Maybe we need more sticks for the others. Great. Yeah. Well, yeah. Marco, John, thanks so much for being with us today. I don't know, John, if you have some final remarks you'd like to yeah. add. Yeah, I just want to share. Uh, just, just want to share quickly in in Canada. So I'm I'm based in Toronto, Canada. So also, actually, our government created this uh, Cyber Secure Canada. So it's like a certification program for small medium businesses. So this is, that is compulsory? The, the, so, sorry. Is it compulsory? It, yeah. So, but it helps. Like for example, if you're a medium business. So if you follow this program from from the uh, to get this certificate, it gives you that trust or level, uh, saying that okay, based on the requirement that the government said, uh, the Cybersecurity Canada said, I'm on the level that I can say to my customer that even though I'm a small or medium businesses, I'm protecting my, I, I I'm prepared to protect myself. So it those What's type of program. To, to to look it up online. Yeah, it's a cyber secure. Canada. Oh, wonderful. That's easy to. Yeah. So, to yeah, find. it's exactly. There's a lot of more adding those stuff in, in terms in, in US that too. Uh, like, for example, that CMMC, that's actually a maturity requirement if you want to be a supplier for the Department of Defense. So, to be able to sell something to them, you need to have this done. So th these are some of the drivers out there for business to actually take cybersecurity more seriously, right? Great. I'm gonna share the, the the link that I think I I found so everyone can can look it up. Well, and may I make I a last could... comment, Paulina? I'm so sorry. Just sure. Sorry, so sorry. You can't define a cybersecurity strategy in a company without defining the digital transformation strategy, and also you can't define a digital transformation strategy without thinking about cybersecurity. So be careful for this, because for example, I've been uh, connecting with some companies that they want to resolve all the cybersecurity, but they don't even understand how technology is impacting their business. It's a whole view. Sorry for the last comment, but that's something that has to be, it's not an isolated, cybersecurity is not an isolated topic about the design of your business principles using technology. Sorry, just that. It's a very insightful comment. Thanks so, uh, thanks so much for it. And thanks for your all your uh, lucid information that you gave uh, as well, John. I'll, I'm going to give the microphone back to Manuelita and just say goodbye to you for today. Uh, fascinating subject, and uh, I, I can feel your passion for it and, and how uh, important uh, it certainly is and how frustrating it must be to see the world kind of slow moving towards it. But uh, we thank you very much for your expertise, for your answers, for your uh, participation. Thanks to the audience for being with us. None of this would be possible without you. Um, it's certainly a subject that we can uh, have you guys back for if you're um, willing to. And uh, I, again, thank everyone for being here. Uh, Paulina, thank you for being a fabulous moderator. You have um, a lot of experience and you come with great questions. So thank you so much. Um, as you know, we've recorded this event, and for those of you who want to go over certain information, it will be available on our YouTube channel. And um, also, I'd like to invite you to our next event, which is on Chapter 11 um, and uh, cross-border reorganization of uh, companies that are facing bankruptcy, uh, particularly due to COVID. So, look us up. 
uh, we're on LinkedIn, we're on YouTube, uh, our website. Uh, so thank you everyone. It's been a wonderful webinar. And with this, I'm gonna end our, our meeting today. Thank you.